Thank you, Nico, for that uh, really kind introduction. And uh, thank you all for, uh, for coming. I think this is going to be a lot of fun. So uh, today, we'll be going on a journey to the limits of quantum field theory. And what I mean by that is we'll be looking at which quantum field theories are possible, how can we delineate the boundary of what's possible, and what can that tell us uh, about what we might discover both at particle accelerators and what we might discover about the ultimate fate of black holes. So an example of a quantum field theory that uh, we're all familiar with is the standard model, uh, the particle theory that makes up basically everything you interact with in everyday life, including the quarks, uh, the leptons, uh, and the gauge bosons that hold everything together. And quantum field theory really came out of the major revolutions of 20th century physics. Uh, quantum mechanics, the laws of the very small, and special relativity, uh, the laws of the very fast, uh, coming together in this beautiful framework of understanding nature as sets of quantum fields interacting with each other. So that will be the main uh, focus of study in this talk, but we'll also be talking a bit about the third revolution in 20th century physics, uh, understanding gravity as curvature of space-time and how can we unite this with, uh, with quantum field theory. And the sort of big open questions you should have in the back of your mind uh, during this talk in, in which we'll provide some, some partial answers to some of these questions are, what are the fundamental uh, building blocks and uh, laws of nature? Um, what are the microscopic properties and description of black holes? And more broadly, how do gravity and space-time uh, behave quantum mechanically? But we'll first start out uh, sort of on the particle physics side of things. So as motivation, uh, the Higgs boson uh, has been discovered at the Large Hadron Collider. Um, the, giant particle accelerator on the French Swiss border. But so far, uh, no other new particles, uh, no other new on-shell states beyond the standard model uh, have been observed, unfortunately. And what this means is we might be in an era of particle physics where the first echoes of new physics beyond what we know might come from small deviations, small warpings of the standard model rather than produ production of new unknown particles. So uh, the standard model particles and their interactions are, as I said, an example of a quantum field theory. It's a mathematical description of how particles move and interact. So if I draw an energy scale here from low energies, uh, which correspond to long length scales, we call the infrared, to uh, high energy, small length scales, sometimes called the ultraviolet, no, no relation to ultraviolet light necessarily though. Um, current experiments uh, lie down here, so the LHC. And below that is everything uh, you've ever directly seen, biology, chemistry. Uh, and above this are hopefully new massive particles, new forces, maybe supersymmetry. And above all that is quantum gravity, the scale at which space and time break down. But everything in red here uh, is described by quantum field theory. And there exists a wonderful set of mathematical tools for packaging and understanding how tiny effects from really, really high energy scales uh, from quantum gravity or from new quantum field, field theoretic physics that we haven't yet observed uh, can give echoes uh, in the deep infrared, uh, echoes of new physics that we can observe at long wavelengths uh, that we have access to. And this set of mathematical tools uh, developed by Ken Wilson and others in the late 20th century are known as effective field theory. And so this talk will be an effective field theory talk. So first, a few words about, uh, about effective field theory. Uh, so in physics, uh, the laws of motion can be packaged into something called the Lagrangian, which is uh, a fancy way of writing down different components of the energy. It's essentially kinetic minus potential energy. So the example that you've uh, seen in uh, physics classes would be a roller coaster. So I can write down a, a kinetic energy, subtract off its gravitational potential energy. And if I vary the Lagrangian, and demand that that variation vanishes, I get an equation that is essentially Newton's law, F equals ma. So this uh, idea of packaging degrees of freedom into a Lagrangian and using that to encode uh, the laws of nature uh, translates directly into how we do particle physics. So in theoretical particle physics, the fundamental objects, the fundamental degrees of freedom aren't the height of a roller coaster, but they are quantum fields, things like scalars, uh, fermions, gauge fields, even the metric of space-time. And quantum fields influence each other, talk to each other via interactions, uh, cubic, quartic, and higher point interactions, uh, even uh, 
the Einstein-Hilbert action describing general relativity can be thought of as a bunch of interactions among gravitons. And in, we, we package these all together uh, into a Lagrangian by writing down various operators with various numerical coefficients uh, called couplings. So these, are, these couplings are like dial settings in the laws of physics that tell you how uh, strong any given interaction is. And it will be, it will be useful uh, from an organizational perspective that, that will become clear uh, to break up uh, the Lagrangian according to mass dimension, according to how it scales under dimensional analysis. So the leading order terms, terms with mass dimension less than or equal to four, include kinetic terms, uh, the standard model. Basically, these are these are the biggest effects. But the the echoes of ultra high scale physics are in these other kind of terms, what are called higher dimension operators, higher mass dimension, uh, mass dimension larger than four, and they encode the echoes of new physics at some ultraviolet scale m because these operators have higher mass dimension. They have to get divided by some uh, mass scale, they have the units work out. And that mass scale tells you where the new physics shows up. And these uh, coefficients, these coefficients of higher dimension operators, sometimes called Wilson coefficients, are what we'll be thinking about in this talk. If we know the full theory, we can just calculate these couplings. But if, we're, if all we have access to is the infrared, all we know are the laws of physics as currently known today, they're unknown dial settings and the laws of physics that we want to constrain. So let's see uh, how this works in, in a simple example. So consider, uh, here's a, a toy theory of a massless scalar phi. You can think of it kind of like the Higgs boson and some, uh, even though the Higgs has a small but finite mass and a massive scalar sigma. So sigma might be some really massive particle we haven't yet discovered. All right, and suppose phi and sigma interact through some cubic interaction. I'll draw the Feynman diagram here. Now, at low energy scales, we can integrate out sigma, we can do the path integral over sigma to get the effective theory we would see uh, at really, really low energies. And what we would see is just an effective quartic interaction among phi's because we're at too low of energies to produce sigma directly. And so we have some d phi to the fourth effective operator uh, divided by some mass scale here to make the units work out. And so here we've computed the coupling for the d phi of the four operator, but a priori this could have been uh, some arbitrary number. So what if the microscopic physics is unknown? What if we don't know full-blown quantum gravity or you know all particle physics up to arbitrarily high energy scales, which is the situation we're in? What do we do? Well, we can write down a Lagrangian built out of the operators uh, that we can construct with arbitrary couplings and just quantize it, compute amplitudes and cross sections, etc. But amazingly, this process is not guaranteed to create a consistent set of laws of physics. It turns out not all choices of couplings are allowed. Uh, from the menu of particles, interactions, couplings, and symmetries, certain combinations are permitted and certain combinations are provably forbidden because they violate certain fundamental physics principles. Uh, principles like unitarity of quantum mechanics, which is a mathematical way of encoding conservation of probability, uh, causality, so no time machines, uh, analyticity, which we'll come back to, which is sort of like locality in the laws of physics, or self-consistency of thermodynamics, in particular thermodynamics of black holes. And I'll, I'll call all of these principles and, and things like them infrared consistency. It's the requirement that the ultimate physics at really high energy scales behaves uh, according to self-consistent principles that we observe and know to be true about reality at long distances. And over the past uh, couple of decades, but really accelerating uh, in the last few years, uh, the community has placed a bunch of different infrared consistency bounds on a whole litany of theories. So here I've highlighted some examples, particularly ones that uh, my collaborators and I have worked on, uh, ranging from bounding directly connections to uh, the standard model, corrections to the standard model effective field theory, all the way to uh, corrections to Einstein gravity. So bounding uh, quantum gravity itself and sort of everything in, in between. So how this, how this looks schematically is we have some parameter space of couplings for some deviations, for example, from the standard model. And our experimentalist colleagues uh, will place some bounds that generically look like this, error ellipses around the origin some limits on the size of these couplings. But infrared consistency bounds generically cut through this parameter space and rule out an order one swath uh, passing through the origin. 
So you can see that placing bounds from infrared consistency makes experimental bounds that much more statistically significant. If you know that uh, it has to be in, in the light blue region, uh, you can increase the, the statistical significance of bounds you place. Uh, flipping that around, if uh, shockingly uh, the experimentalists were to discover some non-zero coupling in the forbidden region, that would tell us something profound. It would tell us that fundamental physics at, sh at short distances is violating one of our cherished principles of how quantum field theory works. So in that sense, um, placing these bounds from infrared consistency is a really sort of powerful uh, testing mechanism for what we believe to be true about uh, the tenets underlying quantum field theory to really, really high energies. So, and indeed the Large Hadron Collider uh, collaborations are already bounding higher dimension operators like this in the standard model EFT. So here are some uh, recent plots, but they haven't yet taken into account uh, infrared consistency or they're just beginning to take that into account. So it's a really, really exciting time to be uh, thinking about this sort of thing. Right, so how is it that we can uh, rule out certain laws of physics? Well, Let's go back to that example theory of, of the massless scalar. So here I'll just write down the effective theory. So it's kinetic term plus an effective quartic interaction with some unknown coupling C. So let's first just compute the equation of motion for phi. I won't write it down, it's somewhat long, but we can expand it around a condensate background. So this is kind of like the scalar version of a constant electric field background. You have some uh, constant four vector Q mu uh, describing the derivative of phi. And we'll take a little perturbation uh, around that background. We'll send some blip of phi through this condensate and compute its speed. So we can do that. Uh, we can write down a plane wave on sats and compute the speed. And in units of the speed of light, uh, the speed is one minus a positive number times c. So what this means is that if c were negative in our uh, original EFT, then we could engineer a causal paradox uh, because V would be greater than the speed of light. And we could take two bubbles of the condensate and give them a relative boost and send out a signal and receive it back before it left, uh, which is obviously unacceptable. So therefore by causality, C has to be positive in any healthy effective field theory. So interestingly, causality is telling us one thing, we can get that same conclusion uh, from quantum mechanics rather than, uh, rather than using classical causality. And to do that, we'll need to do a little bit of uh, cal calculus with complex numbers. Uh, so here I'm going to uh, compute the scattering amplitude, uh, A for uh, phi to phi scattering. Uh, here S is the center of mass squared uh, in, uh, in the, the relativistic center of mass squared. It's, it's uh, called the Mandelstam variable. And I'm analytically continuing in S. So I'm treating S as, uh, as a complex number. Uh, this is justified by locality. So a fundamental fact about the laws of physics is that they're local. If I take quantum fields and wiggle them right here, they don't instantaneously wiggle in the Andromeda galaxy. Influences take time to propagate. Uh, what that means is that the laws of physics care about a finite number of derivatives. They're not infinite order in derivatives. Uh, and if I Fourier transform that to momentum space, that means that scattering amplitudes are analytic functions of complex momentum. So all I'm doing is I'm doing a contour integral around the origin here to extract the coefficient from the scattering amplitude. And then I'm deforming it to this new contour C prime that runs above and below the real S axis plus some big boundary term at infinity that you can show vanishes. Now, this discontinuity over the real s-axis, you can write down uh, as the imaginary part of the amplitude, uh, which by the optical theorem in quantum mechanics turns into the cross-section. So the optical theorem is just a statement from unitarity of quantum mechanics. Uh, I won't have time to prove it today, but it's, it's just the cross-section. It, it's the effective area for the scattering of two phi particles. So that means C, uh, this low energy number in the EFT is really encoding the integrated area of the cross section integrated over uh, the ultraviolet. And since it's an area, it's, it's positive by definition. So again, quantum mechanics and locality are telling us the same thing that causality uh, taught us classically. So that's how we can bound the laws of physics. Now let's actually apply this uh, to bounding corrections to the standard model that we could see in the very near future at particle accelerators. So this part of the talk will be based on, uh, on this set of papers. Right, so first I'm going to talk about the uh, bosonic sector of the standard model, so the gauge bosons, uh, the, the gluons, 
the W bosons and uh, the U1 gauge bosons, uh, along with the Higgs. So I'll just flash up what sort of operators we're talking about, uh, just to give you a sense of the scope of the problem. So we can contract the different gauge field strengths in all sorts of different ways. Uh, we can write down cross cortex. We can include interactions among Higgs bosons or even among Higgs bosons and gauge fields. Uh, the details of this aren't, uh, aren't important for this talk. I'm just giving you a sense of what, what these sort of things look like. And after a really massive calculation where we compute uh, how these operators deform all the different possible scattering processes in the standard model and require that they obey all of our causality and uh, locality constraints that I showed you for the example theory. So basically computing a bunch of Feynman diagrams uh, uh, of the sort shown here, we derive a bunch of constraints. So of the 64 uh, quartic bosonic operators at uh, mass dimension eight in the standard model EFT, we get 27 independent uh, bounds, 20 of which are positivity bounds. So these are the direct analogs of what you saw for the uh, B5 to the four theory but seven of which are of a different character. They're magnitude bounds. They tell you that the absolute value of certain couplings has to be less than certain other couplings. And these C tilde operators are ones that break uh, CP symmetry, so break charge parity symmetry. Uh, in, in, in particle physics language, this is another way of saying they, these operators break time reversal symmetry. So uh, these magnitude bounds are telling us that these symmetry violating operators uh, can't be too large compared to their uh, symmetry preserving uh, cousins. And all told, uh, IR consistency here gives us a factor of roughly 100 million uh, reduction in the parameter space of the bosonic sector of the standard model EFT. So this is hugely powerful in placing constraints on what we might see. Now, as, as I pointed out, we noticed a pattern in the positivity bounds. They come in two distinct forms, either in pairs of positivity bounds or uh, single magnitude bounds. And you can visualize this as, as a cone. There's some allowed region uh, inside the cone and a forbidden region outside it. Now, not only uh, do these IR consistency bounds immediately sharpen existing experimental uh, observations. So here is some uh, contour from CMS, one of the Large Hadron Collider groups uh, overlaid with the forbidden and allowed regions coming from our bounds but our bounds can tell us new places to look. So here's uh, another set of parameters that we can bound uh, for which uh, the experimentalists haven't yet uh, done, the, done the analysis, but which can be extracted from LHC data. So this tells us other good observables uh, to test at colliders. Not only that, uh, IR consistency bounds of this sort uh, can connect qualitatively different experimental measurements. So I, I emphasize that our bounds tell us that CP violating operators uh, have to be generically smaller than their CP conserving analogs. And one place where you might see uh, CP violation or equivalently violation of time reversal symmetry is if the neutron has an electric dipole moment. So a neutron electric dipole moment you can show violates uh, time reversal symmetry. And this is being tested in low energy experiments compared to colliders, think uh, giga electron volts, not tera electron volts. And it's possible that a non-zero neutron electric dipole moment could be generated by one of these four gluon operators. And this could be potentially seen uh, in the next few years. They're already pushing into the several hundred GeV range in terms of uh, the scale of the effective operator. If that were to be observed, it would immediately tell you that the CP conserving analogs of that operator have to also be present and be at least as large. That means appear at that scale or lower. And that's exactly the sort of thing that the LHC can measure, uh, can measure deviations to gluon gluon scattering. So this would be a really interesting sort of predictive machine in that an observation of some non-zero symmetry violation in one experiment immediately tells you something totally different about another experiment just by virtue of causality and consistency of quantum mechanics. Right. So I should add that uh, analogous conclusions also hold for uh, flavor violating operators among the fermions. And if I have time at the end of the talk, I'll come back to the fermions and uh, tell you some new things uh, about some of our latest work, how we're pushing down from mass dimension eight to mass dimension six. So I'll, I'll come back to that uh, at the end if, if there's time and interest. Uh, but for now, I want to move on 
to black holes. So we'll set aside particle physics for now and see what can infrared consistency tell us about the ultimate fate of black holes. Um, let's see, I just see a question here. Uh, William asked, uh, the diagrams you draw seem to suggest that IR consistency bounds often cut out the portion of parameter space that intersects with experimental results. Um, right, so the reason that is the case is that positivity bounds almost always intersect the origin. Uh, you, you can always, if I, if I multiply all the coefficients, for example, by epsilon, I can usually tune epsilon to zero without violating IR consistency. So IR consistency bounds always intersect the origin. And experimental observations, if they haven't found one of these new operators, are typically error ellipses around the origin uh, as well. So that's, that's why uh, that happens. It's not a selection effect. It's, uh, there, there's a reason for that. Uh, good question. All right, so now we're going to talk about bounding, um, bounding quantum gravity. Oh, sorry, someone else asked a question. Am I limited to four dimensions? Um, no, I'm not limited to four dimensions. You can place these bounds in arbitrary dimension. Um, for the purposes of this talk, I've constrained myself to the phenomenologically relevant case of four dimensions. Uh, but no, you can, you can absolutely place these bounds in other dimensions. Uh, and some of the bounds are, are indeed dimension dependent. And in fact, what kinds of operators you can write down even varies depending on how many space-time dimensions you have. Good, okay. So first, um, a few words about uh, string theory. So I've shown you uh, that in the space of all uh, low energy theories here shown in gray, the set of infrared consistent laws of physics is a, is a finite subset of that uh, shown here in blue. And within that uh, lies the string landscape. So string theory famously gives you a huge number of possible sets of low energy laws of physics. People like to quote numbers like 10 to the 500, but it's, it's very, very large, uh, the number of string vacua. Uh, so large that it is impossible to enumerate them all. And so what we need is some way of characterizing what set of laws of physics can come from string theory and which ones can't. It might be possible that the string landscape runs up against the boundary of the blue region here, against the boundary of all possible IR consistent laws of physics. It might even fill the blue region. This is an open question. But the quest to find the boundary of the string landscape here, um, coupled with also the quest to find the boundary of the set of IR consistent laws of physics, goes by the name uh, the Swampland program. The Swampland here being uh, the complement to uh, the landscape. Uh, I didn't name these things. <laughs> uh, but one of the most important conjectures to come out of the small plan program, uh, a way of characterizing what sort of laws of physics are allowed and consistent with quantum gravity is something called the weak gravity conjecture, which uh, helps explain why gravity is the weakest force uh, in our universe and why it had to be the case. So what we're going to be doing is doing some thought experiments with black holes. So we're going to be thinking beyond the black holes that we encounter in astrophysics. Uh, and in, in particular, thinking about charged black holes. The, the low energy laws of nature in our universe, uh, which are Einstein plus uh, Maxwell's equations, uh, permit various types of spinning and charged electric and magnetic black holes. So it's those kind of solutions that we'll be thinking about because these provide an amazing theoretical laboratory to push our understanding both of particle physics and quantum gravity. So in particular, let's talk about uh, non-spinning charged black holes. So you take a black hole, drop an electron into it. Uh, this is called the Reissner Nordstrom solution. It has an inner horizon and an outer event horizon. We'll be concerned with the outer horizon and outside of it. And it's characterized by two parameters, a charge and a mass. And classically, there's an upper bound on how big the charge can be. Uh, the charge to mass ratio uh, can't be larger than one over the Planck mass, at which point the two horizons come together and merge. And when that happens, we have what's called an extremal black hole, where Q equals M. Now, so here's the statement of the weak gravity conjecture. It's an ultraviolet consistency condition for quantum gravity. And it posits that for any copy of electromagnetism, anything that looks like a uh, charge, any long range force uh, coupled consistently to quantum gravity has to have in its spectrum, uh, some state with charge Q and mass M such that Q over M is bigger than one over the Planck mass. So it satisfies the opposite of this condition. Uh, thus for that state, you can characterize gravity as the weakest force. Two such states will repel uh, electromagnetically more than they'll gravitationally attract. And the weak gravity conjecture is viscerally satisfied for uh, the U1 uh, abelian gauge field appearing in the standard model. You know this because when you sit down on a chair, you don't fall through it to the center of the Earth. The uh, uh, electron uh, repulsion is larger than gravitational attraction. 
but this need not have been true. Uh, particle physicists are searching for new fifth forces, uh, new long range forces that are very, very weak. And it's a rational question to ask, uh, could these be weaker than gravity in this sense? Uh, need there always be particles that have large charge uh, under any force? And the weak gravity conjecture claims that that's true. And in the, the remainder of this talk, we'll prove the weak gravity conjecture under a set of assumptions. Uh, the original justification uh, came from thinking about black hole decay. So some object, uh, for example, a black hole with charge Q and mass M can only decay into states with larger charge to mass ratio. The reason is charge has to be conserved and energy has to be conserved. But if the decay is to have some non-zero phase space, that means uh, the decay products have to have some kinetic energy, which means the rest mass of the decay products has to be smaller than the original rest mass. Now, if extremal black holes decay, uh, you get the weak gravity conjecture automatically. And it's a fact of life uh, that neutral black holes are known to decay. Uh, via Hawking radiation, as, uh, as Stephen Hawking taught us in, uh, in the 1970s. But it's, it's an appealing uh, conjecture that all black holes can maybe decay. It's, it would be nice to not have a bunch of exactly stable, you know, huge objects in the spectrum of the theory. That's sort of uh, unnatural seeming from a, from a theoretical perspective. But this isn't a proof. This was just kind of the gut feeling of why something like this should be true. So we're going to prove this using, uh, in part, a thermodynamic argument. Uh, so consider two systems with the same macro state. Uh, so same temperature, uh, overall energy, pressure, whatever. But let's suppose the system on the right has extra micro states. So here I've uh, shown that uh, with a shade of blue here, but can be, you can think of it as some extra internal degree of freedom in the atoms of gas, whatever. Uh, the system on the right with extra modes uh, will by definition have greater entropy. So delta S here is this quantity I'll define as uh, the difference in entropy between the two systems, one with extra microstates, given that they have the same overall macrostate. So now let's replace our two systems with two black holes uh, and do the same sort of analysis. So the black hole in the theory on the left is a plain old Reisman Nordstrom black hole in Einstein Maxwell theory. And the one at right is a black hole that has been quantum corrected with higher derivative terms, just like the sort of terms we were thinking about uh, in the case of the standard model, but now we'll add higher derivative terms in, in quantum gravity. So the, the terms in, in the theory on the right are generated by integrating out some massive microscopic degrees of freedom. And we can compare the entropy in these two theories, and we should find that the black hole at right has larger entropy than the black hole at left. Now, I've given you a, a thermodynamic kind of intuitive justification for this. Um, we can actually prove this rigorously uh, using the Euclidean path integral formulation of quantum gravity for tree level QFTs. Uh, I have the details at the end of the talk if, uh, if we have time to go through them. But for now, let's accept uh, this delta S is positive criterion and see what it gets us. So you might be wondering why, why do black holes have entropy? Well, uh, black holes can famously be thought of as thermodynamic objects because Hawking radiation entails a temperature and where you have a temperature and a mass, uh, you have an entropy, the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy. So in pure Einstein-Maxwell theory, the entropy of the black hole is just its area over 4G, its area in Planck units. For the black hole on the right though, uh, the area has been corrected. The, the quantum mechanical corrections to, that give you higher derivative terms in the Einstein-Maxwell equations uh, change the equations of motion of the theory and therefore change the space-time solution and give you a different area. Not only that, the entropy uh, formula is slightly different. It's not exactly the area, but it's instead given by something called Wald's formula. Uh, I would bother to write it here, but it's, it's the area plus corrections that are, that are known and computable. So, okay, let's, let's write down an EFT for uh, quantum corrections to the Einstein and Maxwell equations and bound the coefficients using this entropy requirement. All right, so here's the theory. This is uh, Einstein, this is Maxwell, and here are the leading corrections that you can have. So curvature squared corrections. So R is a measure of space-time curvature. F is a measure of the, the gauge field. And so you can have eight different types of corrections. Let me define two particular parameters that will uh, be useful. So C0 and C9. So these are just linear combinations of the particular sorts of corrections uh, that we can write down. Now what we're going to do, and I'll, I'll spare you the details of the calculation, but we compute the entropy 
uh, for black holes corrected by these terms. Uh, various types of spinning and charged black holes, even allowing for electric and magnetic charge and various sizes of charges. And we get a set of constraints. What we get is, so here's the entropy shift. Uh, Xi is a parameter measuring how extremal the black hole is. So it vanishes at extremality. Mu is a parameter measuring whether the black hole is electric or magnetic. But the important point is that we get a two parameter family of constraints. So this has to be positive for all uh, Xi and Mu. And it bounds those coefficients, C0, C3, C6, and C9. In particular, uh, going to the near extremal limit, our bounds imply that uh, C naught is positive. So that particular combination of uh, coefficients that appears in the effective theory. So what does this have to do with the weak gravity conjecture? We'll, we'll, find, we'll find a miracle uh, in a minute. So in, uh, in Einstein-Maxwell theory plus higher curvature terms, the extra operators uh, not only modify the solutions, but because they modify the solutions, they modify the allowed range of black hole charges. So the original classical condition is that Q over M equals one, but the new extremal value is one plus some shift, which is dictated by the equations of motion uh, that are given to you by this new quantum corrected Lagrangian. And so what we can do is we can compute what is this shift uh, for the black holes perturbed by delta L. So just by direct computation, we find uh, that it goes like C0, that exact same combination of coefficients that we could prove uh, were positive by the entropy argument. So this tells us that the shift in the extremal charge to mass ratio of these quantum corrected black holes is positive. And this tells us the consistency of black hole entropy proves the weak gravity conjecture because now there exist objects in the spectrum of the theory with Q over M bigger than one, uh, namely the quantum corrected black holes themselves. So if I, if I plot uh, the charge to mass ratio of extremal uh, black holes in the theory versus the mass, so at really, really large mass where the quantum corrections are effectively small, uh, it's just one. So one is the usual Reissner Nordstrom value. And these higher derivative corrections shift the line. And what we proved is that the line gets shifted upward. And since it's shifted upward, that means large charged black holes can decay to smaller ones and all the way down which is exactly what you need uh, for the weak gravity conjecture. So I've shown you in this example that the same combination of coefficients happen to come out, but we can actually prove something uh, stronger. We can prove that not only does this generalize to arbitrary numbers of uh, U1 charges, so arbitrary numbers of copies of electromagnetism, to magnetic black holes, spinning ones, and indeed even arbitrary space-time dimension, but there's a profound relationship between the shift in charge to mass ratio uh, the shift in the entropy and the value of the Lorentzian action of the higher derivative terms evaluated on uh, on the black hole solution. So, for example, evaluated on the Kerr-Newman solution. So, this is a this is this really exciting relationship that we found between mass and charge, entropy as a measure of disorder, and the action, which is uh, a measure of the energy of the system. And so, this was this was featured in Quantum Magazine uh, last year, and it tells us really that this, that this fact that the same combination of coefficients uh, happened to come out wasn't happenstance. Uh, it had to happen and, and indeed works for a much larger class of black holes. So my collaborators and I are uh, still following up on some of the consequences of this, of this new relation. So um, I'll, I'll summarize now and uh, then we'll begin taking questions, but then if there's, if there's time I can return back to the fermions or return back to uh, the weak gravity conjecture, like nitty gritty of the proof, depending on uh, what people are interested in. But the summary of what we've seen so far is that um, infrared consistency provides a really powerful tool for constraining the hints of new physics. And in particular, we showed how causality, unitarity, and analyticity uh, let us bound the couplings from physics beyond the standard model and connect them with uh, experimental signals. And moreover, we've shown that uh, consistency of black hole thermodynamics can be used to characterize uh, and constrain corrections to the Einstein equations, uh, which are provable statements in quantum gravity. And under minor assumptions, uh, this leads directly to the weak gravity conjecture. So one of the first proofs of one of these conjectured statements coming from string theory. And the, the bigger picture is uh, this, this set of tools uh, that IR consistency gives us represents a really amazing new bridge between phenomenology and formal theory, that is between QFT and the stringy swamp program. 
and we can connect physics at different energy scales. And it gives us a way of testing what we think is true about field theory up to really high energies and a way of sharpening our search for new physics. So with, with that, uh, I should just add that uh, this talk is just a subset of the things I think about roughly uh, this subset. I spend the rest of my time thinking about uh, entanglement properties of black holes, classical general relativity, other things in scattering amplitudes, holography. And I'll be, I'll be happy to take any other questions you have. So thank you. So I think, uh, I think there were a couple questions in the chat. So let me see. Can you predict uh, the lifetime of uh, black holes? So yeah. Um, so for, uh, for Schwarzschild black holes, you can predict the lifetime uh, fairly straightforwardly because it's, it's dictated by Hawking radiation. For uh, charged black holes, it's more complicated because uh, the emission process involves something called Schwinger pair production. So it's a quantum mechanical process by which you can emit charged objects out of vacuum when you have an electric field. And if, if you give me the spectrum of charged states in the theory, I can tell you what, what the lifetime of your uh, extremal black hole is. But it, it all depends uh, sensitively on what is the spectrum of charged states in the theory. What the weak gravity conjecture tells you is merely that uh, the lifetime of charged extremal black holes is not, is not infinity, um, which, which is important. Um, uh, let's see, someone asks, is there anything interesting to say about loop quantum gravity? Uh, I, I don't have anything to say about loop quantum gravity other than, you know, I think that string theory provides a much more compelling uh, idea for how to quantize gravity than loop quantum gravity, simply because string theory has enjoyed a number of successes that loop quantum gravity hasn't yet replicated. For example, it, it allows you to unify gravity with, uh, with, with gauge fields with, um, and with, with uh, which which loop quantum gravity doesn't do. Also, string theory has been successful in um, accounting for the entropy of black holes, accounting for the Bekenstein-Hawking uh, entropy by string microstate counting, which again is is I don't think something loop quantum gravity has has yet done. Um, okay, good. Uh, so someone asks, what is the mass dimension? How does it relate to ah? Okay, this is a good question. So. Um, the mass dimensions uh, have nothing to do with, with uh, the number of space-time dimensions. Uh, the mass dimension is literally um, a way of counting units when you're working in particle physics units where h bar and c are set to one. So for example, the, the mass dimension associated with uh, a typical field is, is one. So like the mass dimension of, of the Higgs field is one. Uh, the mass dimension of a derivative, it's like one over a length, uh, counts as one, because uh, one, one over a length is a mass. Physics. Kinetic term, uh, like dH dH, has mass dimension four. Uh, and that's that's what leading terms have, or mass dimension equal to four or less uh, in four dimensions. Good. Um, so let's see. Tom asks, uh, how much do uh, my proofs, depending on having an underlying space-time manifold versus there being emergent something else? Uh, this is a great question. OK, so all of these proofs are within the effective field theory framework. So it's possible that uh, you know, at really, really high energy scales above the Planck scale uh, that everything breaks down, space and time break down. But what our proofs apply to are higher derivative corrections to, for example, the Einstein equations or to the standard model when those corrections are generated by massive quantum fields. So still a no space time. And I think that's, I think that's okay, uh, even though that's an assumption, because I don't think you know, that the standard model plus Einstein gravity is all there is. I think there are going to be uh, new massive states uh, that are out there waiting to be discovered, particles waiting to be discovered. And so those will generically induce corrections of this sort uh, below the Planck scale. So, so as long as we're below the Planck scale, uh, our proofs apply. If, if there's nothing between what we've already discovered and the Planck scale, then that's, that's unfortunate uh, for physics uh, more broadly than, than just us. Any other questions? Otherwise, I'm happy to tell you about uh, the, the latest thing that we've done on, uh, in terms of the standard model fermions. Maybe I'll briefly tell you about this just because it's, I think it's really cool. So breaking six barrier. Uh, so 
let's talk about the fermions uh, in the standard model, uh, the quarks and leptons. So uh, they come in uh, various families, importantly. Uh, so there are quarks and leptons. They have various charges, and they're SU2 and SU3. But the most salient point uh, for this talk is that they're each labeled by a generation index running uh, from 1 to 3 in the standard model, which defines the flavor quantum numbers, uh, charm, uh, electron number, muon number, tau number, uh, et cetera. And what we'll do is we're going to build the leading order uh, fermionic corrections to the standard model. So traditional dispersion relations require bounding operators uh, uh, with at least four powers of momenta, so like four derivatives, so mass dimension eight or larger, like, like we saw in the examples I showed you. Uh, but the standard model EFT really starts at lower mass dimension. It starts at dimension five, where there's the single Weinberg operator, which generates neutrino mass. But things really uh, get going at dimension six, where you can write down four fermion operators. But Traditional dispersion relations, traditional uh, amplitudes arguments don't apply in the forward limit uh, because the, when the Mandelstam variable t so measuring the momentum exchange vanishes, uh, the amplitude itself either goes to zero or flips sign, uh, which stymies a straightforward application of positivity bounds. So what can we do? Well, we can be more creative. We can extract derivatives in, uh, in t. t is kind of a measure of the angle away from uh, the forward limit where the particles pass through each other. And so we find the following uh, relation between the low energy amplitude and the high energy amplitude in terms of derivatives. But this isn't still quite what we want because you can prove that the first two terms are positive, but the third term uh, you can prove is negative. So this still doesn't get us uh, a bound like we want. Uh, we, can, we, can keep, we can keep hammering at this and expand it in partial waves. So we're expanding into, into intermediate massive states of definite total angular momentum. Uh, but if I'm scattering in an electron and a positron, say, my initial total angular momentum isn't zero, it's one. And when you start out with angular momentum and you're scattering, uh, the partial wave expansion is done using the familiar uh, Legendre polynomials uh, that we all learned. Instead, what one has to do is something called uh, Jacob Vick expansion into, uh, into the states of definite angular momentum in using instead of Legendre polynomials, uh, the so-called Wigner D matrices. And so they look slightly different. And in terms of uh, these sort of spinning polynomials, uh, we can rewrite our dispersion relation into a form that's manifestly positive. So here, uh, everything is positive. Uh, the sum goes from intermediate spin one to infinity. And so we've derived a new positivity bound on derivatives of the amplitude around the forward limit using only three assumptions that uh, the ultraviolet is Lorentz invariant, unitary and local, that in the deep UV, the amplitudes diverge more weakly with large momentum, and that the uh, derivative uh, Jacobic expansion used here uh, converges. So we can write down all the different four fermion operators in the standard model EFT. There are a bunch of them, just like for the bosons. And we get, amazingly, the same qualitative sort of bounds as we found previously, which tells us that uh, now, instead of CP, now it's violating operators versus flavor conserving operators we can think about. So for example, three electrons goes to a muon. Is that large or small compared to uh, two electrons goes to two muons? And I should emphasize that this is the first time that model independent bounds like this have been derived uh, from the leading matter deviations from the standard model, purely using uh, structure scattering up, totally agnostic about what the details are of the UV completion. And so there are really cool prospects for detection. We could write down the, some flavor violating scale, lambda tilde, and a flavor conserving scale, lambda. And our bounds imply that uh, lambda, the scale of new physics that's flavor conserving, is lower, so is more immediately accessible. This, al again, allows us to connect qualitatively different experiments. So there's the, the mu3e experiment, which is targeting uh, the decay of a muon to three electrons, which violates uh, flavor symmetry which would correspond to a flavor violating scale of between 80 and 800 TeV. That's a little inaccessible. So let's instead look at taus. So the current bounds on tau decay put the flavor violating scale at around 7 TeV or larger, uh, which is probably going to be improved to around, 10 to, uh, around 25 TeV uh, by the Bell 2 experiment shown here. So it's a particle accelerator, but it's a relatively small one compared to the LHC. It's in the GeV range, not TeV range. Uh, but the LHC bounds on uh, flavor and CP conserving terms are that lambda has to be bigger than one or two TeV. So that means near-term detection of flavor violation in uh, decay of the tau, decay of this uh, heavy 
cousin of the electron, would imply a near-term flavor conserving new physics that lies in the in the 10 TeV range. So a guarantee of new physics, uh, which would be which would be really exciting. Um, right. So so that's all I want to tell you right now. So this was from uh, the end of last year, but uh, this is a, a taste of how we're generalizing these ideas to uh, place bounds on on yet more operators. Let's see. I think there's a, another question. Oh, uh, great, from Nico. Uh, each, each fundamental physical principle, Lorentz invariance, causality, unitarity, things to bring in, yeah. Um, good, yes, uh, we're, we're constantly trying to think of new uh, ways to constrain uh, IR physics. So in fact, black hole thermodynamics is a principle for constraining IR physics that we just introduced um, in late 2018 when we, when we wrote that paper. So pr prior to that, people had really only constrained new physics using uh, either causality, uh, which was introduced uh, as a means of constraining these operators in a 2006 paper by Nima Arakani Hamad and friends, or amplitudes methods that date back to uh, the S matrix program of the 60s. So yeah, there are there are a lot more um, things we can we can do, um, and you know the more sort of assumptions you invoke about the UV, of course, the more you get from it. So our dimension six bounds uh, invokes slightly stronger assumptions about the UV and that we're assuming that uh, not only locality, but also that these uh, Yukob wick expansions converge, which not too technical, but it, it involves some assumptions about uh, how many higher spin states you have in the theory. Um, right, so, so yes. Uh, the set of all possible principles to be used for constraining new physics is is also not yet known. Um, or someone asked, uh, uh, Chris asks, what are the most possible, most promising uh, low energy experiments in addition to the neutron dipole moment? Um, right. Well, uh, aside from the neutron dipole moment, I would say it's uh, it's these flavor violation experiments, right? Uh, like like the these experiments at super KEKB in Japan, which have the possibility of connecting with um, with our dimension six bounds. Yeah. Uh, Grant, I think there's a question uh, from Asim that you missed earlier. Uh, to what oh, sorry. Do you think, yeah. yeah, so to what extent do you think advancements in QFT and small corrections to existing theories will yield a unifying theory of everything equation? Oh, okay, well, uh, that's that's an interesting question because it, it depends on what, what you mean by a, a unified theory of everything, right? It's, you know, in, in the century, everyone sort of hoped that there was only one set of possible fundamental self-consistent laws of physics. So that is in, in modern language, only one possible vacuum in quantum gravity. Uh, we don't know whether that's true or not. Um, people then found that string theory seemed to contain 10 to the 500 possible different vacua, which you could think about as 10 to 500 possible different fundamental uh, theories. Um, that's since been called into question, and it's possible that there are far less. Uh, so the, the jury is out on that. Uh, I'm personally of the opinion that IR consistency probably delineates the full boundary of the string landscape, that it's it's probably possible to fully understand all of the different possible sets of laws of physics uh, that are consistent with quantum gravity purely using these infrared consistency techniques. And even though that might seem surprising, uh, there are a lot of surprising UV IR connections that, that we've seen. I mean, the weak gravity conjecture is itself an example of a UV IR connection. Why, like why, why should quantum gravity dictate uh, the sizes of gauge couplings? And yet it does. So I think ultimately that IR consistency can help us understand the full set of possible self-consistent laws of physics, whether or not you want to think of all those different sets as, as you know, different ways in which one single fundamental theory can break. Uh, you know, hopefully that turns out to be the case. But yeah, I think, I think this is an important part of getting us there. We've got another question. Oh. Any thoughts on dark energy or dark matter? Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, <laughs> uh, I think dark energy is likely to be the cosmological constant. I mean, uh, people people like to write down models where dark energy um, 
dynamically evolves in time. And so you get a cosmological constant effectively that changes with time, kind of like a later universe um, epoch of uh, the inflation that we believe happened in the first trillionth of a second. It, you know, to make dark energy models, dynamical dark energy models work, they typically have to be pretty fine tuned in a way that sort of doesn't look very natural. Um, but we, we should test. Uh, the cosmologists are, are trying to measure whether or not uh, the effective equation of state parameter of the cosmological constant evolves in time or not. And if it, if it, if it did, that's fantastic. It would be new particle physics. Um, as for dark matter, uh, I, I think it's probably, again, some, some fundamental particle that we haven't yet discovered that's uh, you know the 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 WIMP paradigm isn't totally dead yet, although it's uh, it's it's somewhat constrained at least by the fact that we haven't seen superpartners at the LHC. But it might not be a supersymmetric uh, uh, weakly interacting massive particle. It might be just some other weakly interacting massive particle uh, that's that's not associated with uh, the supersymmetrization of the standard model that, that we haven't discovered yet. So we should we should keep doing these experiments and keep uh, keep trying to find things out.